It is a wonderful opportunity to be able to be here together as, as family rejoicing in the feast as it was brought up in the, the first message, and it's great to be able to be together singing and praising our Father. We're going to get right into it, so if you open your Bibles, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 21 to start off the message. Matthew chapter 21, verse 23. This is a uh, kind of a bit of a, a preamble here. Matthew chapter 21 Verse 23, Jesus is here. Uh, he goes into the temple. Verse 23, uh, when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority do you do these things, and who gave you this authority? So right off the bat, they're coming in and they're questioning his authority and his ability to do the teaching that he was. And we know that a lot of people marveled at that, marveled at his understanding, marveled at how he taught with authority. So Jesus answers him and says, I'll tell you, if you answer this question that I'm going to pose. Verse 25, the baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? And so the Pharisees and the chief priests, they start reasoning amongst themselves and say, well, if we, if we say it was of heaven, then... He's going to catch us, and he's, he's going to tell us, well, why, how come you didn't listen to John? How come you didn't heed him? If we say if it's of men, well, then we're going to have an uprising. The people are going to come after us. And so they feared, they feared having to submit to the authority of what John was teaching, and they feared the people. And so they tell him in verse 27, or sorry, they tell him in... Uh, yeah, verse 27, he said, We do not know. And so he says to him, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And instead of letting up, instead of being uh, kind of cowed into a corner that he just got confronted, Jesus then starts into a few parables. Verse 28, But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And the son answered and said, I will not. But afterward he regretted, and he went. Then the man came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go. I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? So the scribes, or the chief priests and the Pharisees say to, say to Jesus, they said, The first. And Jesus says to them, Surely I say to you, that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But, if, but tax collectors and harlots believed him, and when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. So he hits right at the thought process that they had. They're like, well, if we tell him, if we, tell him we, we believe it was of heaven, or if we tell them that we believe it was of man, he's like, he came, he had the authority, and you didn't listen to him, and other people did. So he's striking right at their rationale, right at their reasoning. And he goes on again. Verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain landlord who planted a vineyard and set a hedge about it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to, a vine, leased it to a vine dressers and went into a far country. Now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive his fruit. Its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. And again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. And last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said amongst themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him, cast him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the, vine, of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? And the chief priests answered Jesus Christ, and they said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. And Jesus says to them in verse 42, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls to the ground, whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. 
Now when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking to them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. So if you're reading this and you're hearing the parable that Christ is giving them, and then you're seeing how they want to act, they're, they're really there. The mindset of the Pharisees is right in line with the exact parables that Jesus just read to them. And this is a big transition because he's telling the Pharisees, he's telling the people, the, the Jews, the nation of Israel at the time, what's going to happen. He's telling them, you know what? I came to you. God sent people to you. And you ignored them. You beat them up. You, you threw the prophets out. You wouldn't heed their calling. You wouldn't listen to them. And so, we're going to change it. We're going to change. God is changing. He, he sent His Son. And you, you haven't killed His Son, or you're going to. It's prophetic of his, own, of his own death and how they're going to treat Him. But the relationship that happens and transitions here from the parables we read in chapter 21 to the parables that we read in chapter 22, which is where we're going to go next, talks about the relationship and the opening of the door that we then have because God stopped just working with a physical nation of Israel. And He started working with individuals, a different kind of individual than, well, I happen to be a Hebrew, and so now I can have a relationship with God because He's the God of our people, and all of you other people can just stay out. It's a different kind of relationship. Let's go to chapter 22, just continuing on here, Matthew chapter 22, verse 1. Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables, and He said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son, and sent out his servants to call those who, to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, He sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who were invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. A lot of what we read in the other parables, how they were treating the servants and how they were treating the individuals that God sent. But when the king heard about it in verse 7, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city, as he did when the nation of Israel turned their back on him. He let them go into captivity. And they were destroyed in great part as a people. Then he said to his servants in verse 8, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. We're here on the day of trumpets, the feast of trumpets, to celebrate a wedding feast. We're here to celebrate that marriage between the church and Jesus Christ. We're here to partake in a portion of this parable. But this turning point that we talked about, and I referenced a little bit earlier, God moves from just working with a, a specific nation of people, and He says, you know what? You didn't come. You beat my servants. You killed my son. Now I'm going to work with those people who I can get, <laughs> those people who will listen to me, it's a, different kind of, it's a different kind of individual. You know, you can read in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, you know, he who has an ear, let him hear. God wants people that are willing to listen. He wants people that are going to hear. So today in this message, we're going to talk about three sections of this parable we just read, the parable of the wedding feast. Three sections of this parable and see how they relate to us on this Feast of Trumpets. The first section, the first scripture there, is in Matthew chapter 22, verse 9. Where it says, therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. Now, if you, uh, if you plan a wedding, you don't usually just invite anybody. Usually it's family and friends. 
I think many of us have been there. If you haven't been there, you'll soon find out. You can send out all the RSVPs you want. You can give them an addressed envelope with a stamp, and you'll get about a 40% response rate. Maybe 60 if you've got some, if it's really tight and small. And then, of those 40% who say yes or no, or actually of the, of the people that say yes, maybe they'll all come. But you don't know. Maybe the people who never told you still want to come. So you have to get chairs, and you got to set them up, and you have to pre plan and prepare for the food, right? So all these preparations go into it. And this wedding feast that God has planned, all the people that he wanted to be there, he really wanted them to be there, they had other things to do. They go to their farm, they take care of their business, they're like, well, well you know, it's only a wedding, whatever, whatever the rationale is. But they don't see the value in the invitation. And so God says to the servants, he says, go out, go to the highways and call whomever will listen. Now it's interesting, we're going to do a couple Greek words here, so um, the first one is for the word highways. The Greek word is de-exodus, de-exodus, D-I-E-X-O-D-O-S, de-exodus. And it means the point of entry or exit into a city. So we're here in Phoenix. Go to the I-10. I want you to get as many people as you can stop on the highway and invite them to a party. Who's going to stop? We've all seen individuals holding a sign. And the proportion of people that stop to help them out is very low. What if you're at Sky Harbor? You say, that's a portal to Phoenix. Let's go over to the airport. And I'm going to try to catch somebody who's coming into Phoenix, going out of Phoenix. Everybody's got tunnel vision. They're going where they're going. But God says, call those people. Invite them in. We need to fill the seats because we have it all prepared and it's all ready. So imagine what this means for us. Another Greek word here in this passage in verse 9 is to find. To find. The Greek word is huresco. Huresco. H-E-U-R-I-S-K-O. Huresco. It means after searching to find something that you've sought after. So you have a mission. You're going out to look for something. And you're looking for that specific thing. And so it's to find something specifically that you have been looking for. It takes action. It's only... Sorry, not this one, but uh, also referencing Matthew chapter 7. You know, we're told in, in verses 7 and 8 to ask, to seek, and to knock. It's an action. And God sent out an active search party to find people who are willing to listen. And so he's done the same thing for us. And this is not to decry or... or belittle our calling at all, that we weren't the original ones that God was wanting to work with. We know that He wanted to work with the nation of Israel. We know that He wanted them to be an example to all the peoples around them. But it didn't pan out. It didn't work out because they were really incapable of it. So God upped it. He upped the game and He said, okay, we're going to send my son, which need, who needed to be sent. He sent His son so that we could actually, actually answer that call. But God has taken great effort to seek us and to find us. And I'll tell you what, we answered. That's why we're here. That's the, that's the big thing. Because when you go about day-to-day -day life, when you're driving up here or to work or whatever you're doing, we get tunnel vision. And it takes a lot to get, grab somebody's attention. It takes a lot to take their focus off of what they're doing or where they're going. But something about God's message struck a chord, and it found fertile soil in each of us, or he's working on it, and he's watering us, and he's fertilizing, and he's trying to, trying to make sure that it's, he can cultivate a crop in our hearts. But there's something about it. There's something about an individual who's willing to stop and willing to pause, divert course, 
Because in essence, what we've done is when God goes out to the highways and the byways, He's there at the, at the gates of the city looking for people. And it's busy. And it's tough to catch somebody's attention. But if you can get it, if you can get it and they'll listen and they say, you know what? That's worthwhile. That is, that's a path that I want to walk down. That's something that I want to do. And we need to remember that. We need to remember that God has specifically called us and something that he has said has resonated with each and every one of us, which is why we're here today. So the point of this section here, Matthew 22, verse 9, is that he's taken great effort to find us. He sought us and he's invited us here to this feast day. And we said, yes, we'll come. I'm not going to go to my farm. I'm not going to go to my business. I'm not going to go do what I was going to do otherwise. I'm going to come to this wedding feast. The second thing, second section here in Matthew chapter 22 is in verse 10. The second section here, Matthew 22, verse 10. It says, So those servants went out into the highways, they gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. So God actually got people who were willing to come, and the hall was filled. And one could say, it's a mixed bag of people. There's bad and there's good. But it's interesting when you look at what the word bad here is, the Greek word for bad is paneros. Paneros. P-O-N-E-R-O-S. And it's not what I thought when I read the word bad. I read bad, I was like, okay, you know what, I, sometimes I have a bad day. Sometimes things are inconvenient and it just turns out bad. No, the word bad here means actively bad of nature or condition. You're evil or you're sick. That's a pretty strong word for the type of people that were invited into this wedding feast. They said, yeah, yeah, I'll come. Sounds like a party. This is going to be great. You got some bad people. According to a Vines Expositor Dictionary, it says, Paneras has a stronger meaning than other forms of the word, Greek words for bad. Paneras alone is used of Satan and might well be translated the malignant one. That's a pretty strong description for individuals that have been invited and answered the call to come to the wedding feast. Let's look at the other word here that describes the individuals that, that answered and came. The word good. The Greek word for good is agathos. Agathos. A-G-A-T-H-O-S. And it means actively good in character or constitution. The exact opposite of bad, which makes sense. But I mean, the bad that we read about is pretty strong. But good here means actively good in character or constitution. God is essentially and absolutely and consummately good. So this is the essence of what and who God is and the description of Him. We can turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. We read, and we know when God created things, that... He created the trees in the garden. Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, and we read about that. Genesis 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put the man whom He had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there's a mixed bag. There's some good, there's some bad. We can say, guess what? That's us. We're human. There's some good attributes, there's some bad attributes. You can also go on. Let's go to, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Because these individuals are not who God had originally intended, or who the, who the Father had originally attended to, intended to have at the wedding. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We 
We're going to go to verse 22. We're going to read through to uh, verse 31. But in verse 22 it says, for, for Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. So these different kind of people with different reasonings, different ways of looking at life. The Jews, they want to have, you know, give me proof. Give me proof. Show me a sign. Show me a miracle. Prove to me what it is that you're saying is truth. And then, you know, then, then I'll consider it. And the Greeks, the Greeks want wisdom. They said, well, if I think about this, if I pontificate enough, if I do enough research, if I have enough sources around it, then, then I'll know that this is true. And if you can't hear threads of what we see in our society in these two mentalities for proving God's way of life, well then, just spend a little bit more time. You'll hear it. Because people want proof. People want to know. It takes that element of faith out of it. But verse 24, To those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because, and that's, what, that's what's preached to us. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. God called the bad and the evil, the people that are willing to come to the wedding feast. People that have those attributes. And God has chosen, verse 27, the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And He's chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. You can have your knowledge, you can have all the signs that you want, but the understanding and the grasp on life that we have, being weak and base and foolish, confounds those individuals that are looking for proof. Confounds those individuals that are looking for a way of rationalizing everything. And the reason this is done, verse 29, is that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in God. So going back to, to Matthew, God called, or God had his servants go out and call those individuals to the wedding feast, the weak and the base, and we can see why he did that. First of all, they were willing to answer the call, but also it glorifies him in the end result. It shows that what he's doing and what he can do through individuals. God specifically called. The point of this section here that we're going over today is that God specifically called a mixed bag of people. He specifically called us with our foibles and our little bits of evil and our little bits of good. He has called us so that, in the end, we get to glorify him through the transition and through the work that we do through this process. We need to remember where we came from. We need to remember that the not many wise, the not many noble have been called. We need to remember, referencing again the churches in Revelation, that we'll hear more about this afternoon, in Revelation 3.17, we need to remember that we're wretched, poor, blind, and miserable to start with. That's, that's what we came out of. But God called us, and He wanted us, and He wants us, as we were when we came in, He wanted us right then. And He said, you know what? I can use that person. I would like to invite that person to the wedding. The third section in this parable, Matthew chapter 22, is verses 11 and 12. Matthew 22, verses 11 and 12. It says, But when the king came to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. If you're a, a parent, have dealt, dealt with kids at all, you have that, uh, I don't know if it's a game or from a TV show or something like that, it says, you know, one of these is not like the others. So he comes into the wedding feast, and he looks around, 
and he realizes this individual looks different. This individual doesn't have a wedding garment on. Revelation chapter 19. It's important to note you know, that we're here, we need to remember that we're here because God selected us. He said, hey, I can use that individual. And that's really important when, when we're down. It's not something to get all highfalutin about and puffed up. But it's something to remember because you know, there are tough times. And sometimes we say, well, why am I here? Why is this, why is this walk so difficult? Why, why do I seem to not be progressing or, or growing the way that, that I think I should be growing? And it's important for us to remember that God has selected us and He's called us out. He selected us from the highways and the byways, and we said yes. And so we need to know that He selected us when we were dirty, when we were evil, when we were unwise and foolish and all of those things. But, as we're reading here in, in Revelation, uh, we're going to be in chapter 19. I don't think I told you the chapter, did I? Okay, Revelation, we're going to go to verse 7 and 8 then. Speaking of, you know, specifically to the future wedding, Revelation 19, verse 7, he says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. She's prepared for the wedding. I don't know of many brides that would just love to go to their wedding in what they got up in that day. There, there's a little bit more a little bit more work that it takes um, that they would like to invest in it. And verse 8, here's how she's done that. To her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. You get this linen, you get this wedding garment through the righteous acts of the saints. It's not, it's not something that we just happen upon. You can't just walk into the, the wedding and expect to have it. This man from Matthew 22, walks in. He just shows up at the wedding. He's like, hey, it sounds like fun. I'll just go. Well, there are things that we should be doing that show our respect, that show our understanding and our, of the gravity of the invitation that comes. You send that RSVP back. You say, yes, we're coming. You find out what colors the wedding party is wearing, and you don't wear them. You know, there are things that you do when you go to a wedding. There are things that you do. You express your appreciation. It changes you know, your behavior. It's not just like going to any dinner. It's a different thing. So the wedding garments that we need to have are expressed here in Revelation 19, verse 7 and 8, that we're to be clothed in them. We're supposed to come to the wedding feast with them, not just anticipate that we can you know, get them on quickly at the wedding. No. We have to be there, going to there, with them on. And they are acquired, they're developed through the righteous acts of the saints. Back in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. Verse 12. I think that the response of the Father is very interesting here. Because he doesn't immediately say, you know, it's not like in a gas of, what? What are you doing here? Get him out. He talks to the individual. He says, friend, how did you come here without a wedding garment? He asks him a question. He engages him. The word friend here, the, the Greek word is hetairos. Hetairos. H E T. A-I-R-O-S. means a comrade, a mate, or partner. It's like my good friend. This is actually only used in Matthew. It's only used four times. But the root meaning of it is derived from the word for clansman, for family member. Somebody you're close to. You have a comrade, you have a partner, you have a good friend. You've walked with them. It's interesting you want to jot down a reference, this is the word that Jesus Christ used when he greeted Judas in Matthew 26, verse 49. 
when I read that that was one of the other areas that it was referenced, it's very powerful. You have the father who's setting up this wedding, who comes in and addresses an individual who's not prepared, who is not ready, and says, my friend, it's like we've walked together, we've done this, we've gone over it. You should have known. Why don't you have your wedding garments on? Why didn't you make yourself ready? How can you do this to me? It's a very powerful relationship when you realize if you've had a friend or if we've been that friend who has destroyed the trust of someone else, it hurts. And you realize, you look on it in retrospect, I've lost, I have lost that bond, I've lost that relationship. And here the father comes in and he says, my friend, where are your, where are your wedding garments? The point here in this section is that God expects us to prepare, to prepare ourselves for the wedding. He called us as we are, as we were, per se. He called us as we were. He says, come as you are. That's a very big thing. Come as you are. Yes, exactly. Do that. But you better change. Come as you are, but change if you want to stay. He expects us to change our clothes. He expects us to be working on those righteous acts. To be working on our character so that we can become more righteous. The Feast of Trumpets is a joyous day. It's really exciting. It's a wedding day. I mean, it's exciting. We had a wedding here not too long ago here in the valley. It's pretty exciting. It's beautiful. Everything is ready. I mean, you've got people that pitch in and help out. You've got people that have been planning for months. You've got, you've got conversation. You have... It's really happy. It's really exciting. And everybody loves a wedding. Even if, even if you're pulling your hair out, you walk out married. And it's a good day. You know, so... We've all been there or hopefully going there or, or you know, even, even here uh, as we're looking forward to the, as we're looking forward to the spiritual wedding, it's something that we can be excited about. We can anxiously await that, look forward to it. You know, God actually tells us, as we were told in the first message, pray that that day comes. Be, be anxiously anticipating it, even though you know that it's going to cause a lot of stress. There's going to be difficult times. All of a sudden, your caterer is going to fall through and you have to find something else. Wh whatever it is, take the analogy that you want to. There are going to be tough times, but he wants us to pray for that. It's going to be difficult sometimes for us to prepare our clothing. It's going to be difficult for us to have righteous thoughts. It's going to be difficult for us to act on those the way that God wants us to. But in order to do that, in order to do that, I want us to remember... We need to remember that God has taken great effort, great effort, to find us. He sought us out. It, it, it still boggles my mind when I look at individuals that are on the side of the road asking for help. And I sit there and I think, wow, it is triple digits. You are a committed individual. You are really striving for something. God is there and He's saying, hey, please. Come to this wedding. I've got everything ready. Will you listen? Will you change? Will you come here? But he's taken great effort to seek us out. And he wants us here. And something struck a chord with us to where we listened and we diverted our path to go somewhere else, to walk a different way, and to get off of that highway where everybody is going. We changed course. We also need to remember that we're not perfect people. We're pretty evil we're pretty good. We're kind of a mixture of the two. Anybody new who walks in the door, guess what? It's going to be kind of evil, kind of good, a mix of the two. And we're all at different phases. And we're all at different points in our walk with God for different things. I don't think I can ever express that enough because I think sometimes we have, uh, we have a mentality that, well, I've been, here, I've been here for 30 years. I've been here for 40 years. So we want to endure. Our job is not to be here the longest. Our job is to work and strive for righteous, godly character. Our, our job is to help each other, to build them up, to edify one another, to, to have iron sharpening iron. 
That's what we're supposed to be doing. It's not about being here. It's about working on, it's about working on those garments. It's about cleaning them because God wants us to do that. He wants us to do that. So regardless of our foibles, regardless of anything that we may see as a shortcoming for us, we need to know that God has called us with that as part of us so that we can overcome it with His help and we can seek Him out and we can ask Him for that. We also need to remember that God expects us to prepare ourselves for that wedding. I think that this is a, a very strong parable to read on the Day of Trumpets because it's both exciting, it's both ex exhilarating to know that God has shifted from moving and working with a physical nation of people and He has opened it up to people that are willing to listen. And the really cool thing about that for us is that we're all here because we're willing to listen. We're willing to listen. And so He's working with us and He's building that family and He wants to have, he wants to have that wedding feast. So as we go about our Day of Trumpets, let's remember that. Let's remember that God has called us. Let's remember, let's remember that we have things to work on. And let's remember that we need to do that preparation to clean our garments so that we can be there at the wedding feast. And we cannot have what says in here in verse, verse 13. Verse 13 to Matthew 22. Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. For there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called... And few are chosen. It takes a lot to find people. It took a lot for him to find people to fill the seats at the wedding, at the wedding supper. Because people are busy. People are going about their day-to-day -day business, to, especially today. It's a Monday. People are going about doing their stuff. But we're here. We've stopped. We've diverted. And we're here to convocate and to congregate with each other and to fellowship and to glorify our great God. So let's do that through our actions, through remembering that calling that we have from him.